Rick Wolf. Thank you all. Fortunately, with everything that's been said, I can be brief because I'm not going to rehash the same points. Uh, I agree pretty much with everything that's been said. It's been my experience as well. Uh, but since my relationship to Steve is unusual in academic life, uh, among economists even more so, I thought a little bit about it might be a good way to get into the material. Uh, I first met Steve Resnick when I was a graduate student in economics um, at Yale University. Um, he was at that time a young assistant professor. I believe it was his first job after he had gotten his PhD at MIT. And uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, the economics profession is a highly stratified, elitist uh, thing. And if you go to school at places like MIT, then you get your job at Yale. It used to be done by a phone call from one professor to another. Certainly how I got, got my first jobs in exactly that way. Um, the call is made, the job is arranged, and then you go give a job talk and you go through a fakery with the people in the department in which they all discuss your merits and the whole thing has been prearranged. Um, I don't know if that's what happened to Steve, but it's certainly what happened to me. And it gives you a flavor of the kind of institution <coughs> Yale was. It was a bad place to be as a student and it was a bad place to be as a young professor. When Steve had the temerity in the midst of the struggles of the 1960s to sign a document that had something to do with the movement at Yale to prevent the CIA from recruiting on the campus for all kinds of reasons. He was basically called in and told that his future at Yale was over. Uh, to make sure it was over, others of us, like graduate students, were also informed by various professors that Mr. Bresnik's career was over. Uh, I had the same experience a little bit later when I was finished with my program, Steve was not on my dissertation committee because I was a little scared of him. Uh, as many, many graduate students, because he had a kind of external demeanor that was scary. So uh, I did the next best thing. I worked with his close associate and friend at that time, Stephen Heimer, that some of you may have worked or read the work of. They were very good friends and colleagues at that time. So I worked with Steve Heimer because he was less scary than me. Steve um, Resnick at the time. But when I uh, was finished and looking for a job, I, I was lucky and I got a job offer arranged by telephone call uh, to begin my career at Johns Hopkins University with an econometrician named Carl Christ at the time. Some of you may know his work. And uh, I chose not to take that job offer and to go instead to teach at City College because it had just had open admissions, allowing people, working class people, to go to university for nothing, free at that time. And I thought that was a better place to go. When I made that decision, my macroeconomics teacher, uh, Jim Tobin, called me into his office and told me it would be the end of my career to make such a foolhardy move. That's Yale University, in case any of you have ever had any doubts about it. So Steve and I became friends, but it didn't go much beyond that. Um, our wives became friends because of the women's liberation movement at the time. I think they were closer friends than we were for a while there. And then I took the job at City College, and a couple of years later, Steve came to City College too. And that's when our relationship began. So we're talking something a little over 40 years ago. We began traveling back and forth from New Haven, Connecticut, which is where both of us lived, to New York City, which is where City College was. And on the train and in the car, we began to talk. We're both pretty uh, reserved folks, so it took us a long time. <laughs> it took us a long time to get to know each other and to begin to trust each other. Uh, but it happened over the two or three years. Um, we thought leaving Yale would get us into a much better place at City College. Uh, that proved to be a bit naive. The students were wonderful and the situation was wonderful, but the faculty was more uh, racked with anxiety, even in the one at Yale, something neither of us had thought was likely but was. Um, but we became good friends and we found some wonderful students, some of whom you've already heard from. 
And so we were close enough that when the situation arose here at UMass in 1973, uh, we decided together that this was something we wanted to do, we could do, and that wasn't reasonable for us because we could work together. In other words, there was enough of a friendship already in place to make that a conjoint decision to come up here. And I want to make it really clear, both because I have an appreciation for UMass that I'll always have because of this, but that when Steve and I came up here as part of a group of five, the other three were Sam Bowles, Herb Gintis, and uh, Rick Edwards, we came up here because we were able to say to the deans here, several of them, who are not here today, um, we were able to say to them, we're going to come up here on one condition, that you understand and that you are agreeable that we are Marxists and we're going to teach Marxian economics. If you're not comfortable with that, tell us now. We don't want to go into a situation where that isn't okay. And the deans, who were so eager for this to go through that it, we, we could have said we're aliens from Mars, <laughs> they assured us it was okay, and I showed my confidence by demanding a signed letter to that effect, <laughs> which, which I have, and, and which I will take with me to wherever you go when you die. Um, and so we came up here, and we came up here because there was enough openness among those people at that peculiar moment in American history, 1973, that it made sense to them that a part of an economics department ought to have, gasp, Marxists among them, uh, clearly so identified and clearly teaching them. Steve and I then worked ever more closely together. It is kind of remarkable because it doesn't happen that often in academia. Academia, like so much of this country, is a very lonely place where people work most of the time pretty much alone. They try to form relationships, but they have a hard time. Across the board, a hard time. Whether it's with the people they live with, or romantically inclined with, colleagues. Working together is a tough game. We are in a very individualist culture. That's why European workers these days, who have a better social safety net than we do, are out in the streets every day, protesting an austerity that Americans remain unable to get themselves together to do anything about, even though they suffer more from it than their European counterparts do. That affects economic, the life of academics too. Despite all that, or maybe because of it, Steve and I formed a, a stronger and stronger relationship. We did weird things in that relationship. We uh, moved our academics at UMass, like elsewhere, each professor gets his own room with his own desk. Against that, Steve and I did the unthinkable. We moved the two desks into one room. <laughs> this freed the other room. So it could become a place where students could meet, and students could meet us, and could do all kinds of things, which for many, many years they did. It's actually the office that still sits there in the corner on the 10th floor of Thompson uh, as a place where we could do something more and better with students by putting our desks together. If you don't get along with somebody, this is not a viable arrangement. Uh, and it's a testimony to what we did. We went to conferences together around the world, from California to Brussels or Paris, did all kinds of things. And sometimes we took our conjoint work to conferences separately. I know that Steve went to Australia for a whole long time and presented our work to places there. I went to Brazil, uh, all kinds of ways that we had of doing our work uh, together. We wrote many books, we wrote many, many articles together. We had a close, intertwined relationship for a long time. Obviously, the most important relationship intellectually and theoretically of my life, I believe that's true of his as well. Uh, it means I can say a few things about him that perhaps uh, will be of interest. First, uh, we had a game we sometimes played since he came from Boston and I came from New Haven and later from New York, when we worked together we would stay in a house that my in-laws bought about 40 minutes from here up in the hills and we would go there and spend a day or two between our class times doing our work together. Most of the major works that some of you know were conceived and developed in that house up in the woods, a house that was built before the American Revolution, a simple little wooden house that's very, very old. 
Um, and we would play a game, what's the thing you hate most in the world, what's the thing you love most in the world? It's a game for whatever reason we found entertaining. Uh, Steve always gave the same answer to what he hated most in the world. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to take that as a theme. He hated hypocrisy. He could handle anything, he said, but having someone look you in the face, say one thing, when everything else they did indicated they believed the contrary, was for him the worst thing imaginable, and to confront it and see it, particularly on an everyday basis, there's a wonderful German word that has no English translation, unerträglich in German. My first, my native language is German, in case you can't tell from the accent. Um, and so it's the word that comes to my mind. Unbearable is the closest English translation. Um, so in that spirit, let me conclude the things that I uh, want to say. Steve was struck, as I was. Oh, I, I should say one other thing. Sometimes Steve and I are asked a peculiar question that seems to be uh, important for American audiences. Uh, which of you did what part of your conjoint work? <laughs> <laughs> Who did? And this, I used to think, was a peculiarity of academics. Because in academia, one of the hypocrisies is that we measure one another according to merit. This is Steve and I, when we weren't falling off our chairs with laughter at the preposterousness of this, would then have fun deconstructing the idea. But in order to play the game of merit, if you do conjoint work, you have a terrible problem. You're, the people who like you will want to believe that the joint work is mostly you. And the people who don't want you will like to believe that the joint work is mostly the other one. So as to diminish your standing or raise your standing, depending on all the millions of factors that shape a decision about a colleague, rather than merit, or to use the language we like better, employment decisions are overdetermined by a million factors. What's on your vita is just one of them. And the claim that merit determines anything is always a stretch. Steve's view, my view. So we answered the question as follows. We long ago lost the capacity to make the distinction. Everything he wrote, he sent to me for my work. Everything I wrote, I sent to him for his work. It went back and forth at least four or five times before it ever saw the light of day. We couldn't possibly disentangle the complicated results of 10, then 20, then 30, and now over 40 years that we collaborated all of the major works that either of us produced were conjoint works over that period of time. So please, don't ask me the question. There is no answer. The problem is with the question. It's a little bit like asking me how heavy Tuesday is compared with Thursday. Most of you will not spend a lot of time answering the question. You'll explain to me that the question makes no sense and disentangling our work uh, is like that. Another close colleague, is your work empirical or is your work theoretical? If you've ever engaged our work, you'll know that these distinctions don't work in the framework with, from which we come. Every piece of empirical work, which both Steve and I did at the beginnings of our careers, we were both in the field of economic history, absorbed in the empirical minutiae of what had happened. And our latest work, the paper we were collaborating on, when Steve died, is also a study, an empirical study of wages and wage benefits and how to calculate them as a part of the wage system and so on. We turned to theoretical work when our empirical work had difficulties. And we went to the empirical work when we thought our theoretical work was read, made it ready to do that. The two things are intertwined. And the distinction makes no sense for us and no sense in our work. Here's what our goals were. So it's real clear and why I think Steve is so important. When we came to UMass and in all the work that we did, we wanted to develop the Marxian framework of economic and social analysis. We were Marxists. Steve was a Marxist all of his adult life. He didn't shy away from the label. He didn't think it was necessary to apologize for it. Clearly, neither do I. But that's what he believed. That's the, the way of approaching the world that he thought made sense. And that meant he was critical of the capitalist economic system. Not this or that detail within it. Not this or that phase of it. 
he wasn't all excited that we should be neoliberal or Keynesian. These were variations in the way you run and manage a capitalist system. That, for him, was the problem. And his point was to develop a critique. Like me, he engaged himself with the idea, very naive. And a naivete we didn't want to let go of. And we used to chide each other for not letting go of it. Here was the naive idea, that in a mature society, if you have a particular economic system like capitalism, that's the one you live with, then a, a mature society would want to engage the understanding of that system that comes out of people who celebrate it and love it, by all means. Love it with more government, love it with less government, but love it. And on the other hand, you'd also want to engage the point of view and the theoretical arguments and the insights developed by people who hate it. Let me give you a model that might help. If you wanted to understand the family that lived down the street from you, two parents and two kids, and you got to know them a little, and you discovered that one child thought that he was the luckiest person on earth to have been born in that family and is grateful and deeply in love with the family and their parents. And the other child, she didn't think so. She kind of thought her family was psychological dysfunction materialized and that her life was the worst for it and that she was spending an awful lot of time trying to get out from under the legacy of her parents. If you wanted to understand the family, would you talk to only one child? Or would it be necessary for you, just as a matter of intellectual honesty, as well as desiring to understand it, to talk to both of the children, to hear them out, and then make whatever judgment you thought flowed from what you got? And in our naivete, we thought the American University was a place where you would want in an economics department to have the people who think capitalism is a wonderful, that it generates a unique, stable equilibrium that is Pareto optimal. But that you might also want to hear what the people thought who thought the system was a disaster, that the human race could and should have done better than this long ago. That when the French Revolution ushered in liberty, equality, and fraternity instead of feudalism, and thought that by establishing capitalism you'd secure liberty, equality, and fraternity, and then discovered Marx's life, that capitalism not only didn't bring liberty, equality, and fraternity, but was as big an obstacle to it as feudalism had ever been. You'd want a university that would have both perspectives. This was naive. American universities have been too afraid, too gutless, across the board with very few exceptions, to embrace any idea remotely like that. They want celebrants. Celebrants with caveats, but celebrants. And they're very anxious about having Marxists. I remember as a graduate student, when Steve was teaching at Yale, we put pressure on. We had no Marxists at Yale at that time. Not even one. Big, rich, self-assured Yale couldn't dare hire one. So the students went to the powers that be and said, could you, could you maybe give us a part-time one, I think, maybe? And I remember the chairman, a man named Merton Peck, meeting us students, explaining he'd love to. There just weren't any qualified. <laughs> so I raised my hand and I said, I, I, I got a friend. His name is Paul Sweezy. He's a good friend of mine, been a friend of my family's all my life. He's got a PhD from Harvard. The teacher was Schumpeter. He probably could, you know, you, you, you could risk it, a part-time course. <laughs> and Merton Peck looked at us and he said, it's a thought. <laughs> it's a thought. We thought that was, for him, quite generous. Uh, a thought. And it, it did what most of Merton Peck's thoughts did. It, it died. <laughs> and we didn't have it. We couldn't get it. Uh, of course, it's a joke. You're not going to have qualified Marxists if you don't put Marxists in the university who can teach them to become qualified. 
So this is a game if you don't have qualified Marxists because you haven't hired the Marxists. If you hire the Marxists, you get the qualified Marxists. It's a hustle. There was a hustle then, it's a hustle now. What legacy? Well beyond what has been said here before, Steve leaves an enormously rich legacy. Steve really contributes to the Marxian tradition. He's a part of it, but he's very critical all his life. He was very critical of the, the way, he, in his judgment, Marxian economics had got itself into a dead end. A dead end in which you were supposed to always argue that somehow Marxian economics meant that instead of markets, you have government planning. And instead of private property, you have social property. Did Marx talk about those things? Yes. Is that the focus of what he did? Is that it? Is that the summation? No, Resnick thought. That there's a whole theory of how the micro and macro levels work. The production and distribution of a surplus. An old idea. One that Ricardo and Smith found very interesting. Which Mayor Marx got much of it from them. He changed it and developed it, but he got it. Just like the labor theory of value is present in Smith and Ricardo. They invented it. Marx changed it. So Marx wanted to do all these. And Steve said, yeah, let's, let's go back and do this stuff on the surplus. How it's Because I think that's what volumes one, two, and three of Capital are about. What emerged in my mind as Steve's student, still when we worked together, was that this was an unbelievable difference in perspective that could allow a rereading of Marx's work, which is what we then did and what we then developed. That's most of what our work is, a rereading, a redevelopment, but now in a new direction of a Marxism that is first and foremost micro level. What happens in the enterprise? Who produces this surplus? Who gets it? What do the folks who get it do with it? And how does all of that shape the larger society? That became our understanding of what the project was to do. And that's what we've mostly done for the rest of our lives. Steve's to this point, and me for whatever time I have left. That's an amazing breakthrough. That's an amazing contribution. That's being both in a tradition, critical of a tradition, and contributing to a tradition. No mean achievement that he could also be the kind of teacher you've already heard here attested to, that he could help develop a new journal. In 1988, when starting a new journal in Marxism didn't look like a venture capitalist <laughs> dream. <laughs> and yet here we are, 25 years later, published by Routledge, distributed around the world, a major and successful journal, and on and on and on. Amazing what this man was able to do in his life while developing a theory, while collaborating with someone like me, teaching me and working together with me as we went along. An amazing achievement. That he also won every teaching award this university has to offer is, takes it to a whole nother level. That he sat on 50, 70 doctoral dissertations. And I know how much work he did because I sat on the same dissertations pretty much down the line anyway. We did most of that together. We taught many courses together. We wrote everything together. Our desks were in the same office. And we did our work in the same house up in the country. And we sat on the same dissertations. And we all worked on the journal. Extraordinary relationship. I know nothing that I've done could have been done without this collaboration. I believe the same applies to him. But it was a remarkable, fruitful relationship. We also became, in the process, the best of personal friends. So I was real lucky, really lucky. Steve also did yet one other thing to stress. Together, he and I became aware that an intellectual movement was sweeping the non-Marxist world the non-Marxist world, that had started at the beginning of the 20th century and deepened across it. Sometimes this was called structuralism. Sometimes it was called semiotics, post-structuralism, post-modernism, various things. They were agitating and transforming literature, anthropology, psychology, history, virtually every field. Marxists, following Marx, always the best of them, had engaged the major intellectual movements of their time to see what they had to teach Marx and what they had to teach Marxism. Marx was a close student of Hegel. 
he needed to understand what that Hegelianism would do for Marxism. And he did the same on, Lenin did the same, Gramsci did the same. We felt we should do it. And we felt we should see how does this postmodernism affect Marxism and how does this postmodernism affect economics. We discovered, interesting, Marxism as a whole, as a tradition, was terrified about the engagement with modernism and postmodernism and so resisted it. The only thing more obtuse than the Marxist <coughs> community in dealing with postmodernism was the behavior of the economics profession, which has steadfastly imagined that none of this has anything to do with them, with a few exceptions, McCloskey being the most famous, but very few. So instead of interrogating this movement and asking what it could teach to economics, and instead of asking what it could teach to Marxism, most proponents of either of those two disciplines to this day imagine that there's nothing to learn, which is comforting for people who've never made the effort and can therefore convince themselves quite easily of the virtue of what they've done. That was not Steve. Steve insisted that we first find whatever Marxists there were who had engaged the tradition, and it turned out there were several. But the greatest of them was a French Marxist named Louis Althusser. So in the first sabbatical that he and I had here, you masked, First time we had time off, I was dispatched to go to Paris, which I did, and work with Al Sasser, which I did, in order to bring to him what we thought it was about for economics and for Marxism, and to bring that home, which I did. The only reason I did it is my, I'm, I speak French since I've been a child, so I didn't have that problem. Al Sasser did not speak English, so it was necessary to have that relationship at that time. And that was a seminal event for both him and me. As we came back, and I brought back the meetings I had with al Husser and the conversations we had about what Steve and I were doing, and we basically got the blessing from the old man there to continue and to develop this material further, and it was very important to us, very, very important. And so our work is shaped not only by this focus on surplus and class in a new way of reading Marx, but bringing in the interrogated interpretation of postmodernism in terms of how it could help and enrich Marxism. So it's possible to say of Steve, as it is of so few people, he really is an interdisciplinary scholar. He went into the depths of philosophy and epistemology and literature in order to interrogate a movement transforming every other discipline to see what it could do for Marxism and to see what it could do for economics. And his work is the result of this <laughs> extraordinary cross-fertilization about which an awful lot of people talk and very few people do. He did, and it has, it's changing Marxism as I speak, and it has. And it's done that through all the work of all the students, it's done that through the journal Rethinking Marxism, and all the people so far affected with it. Last thing. I left UMass, uh, I retired, that's only in order to get financial benefits that you wouldn't get if you didn't say that. Um, so I, got, I retired at the end of 2008. A very difficult personal decision that Steve and I agonized over four years before it happened. Because for both of us, in the academic world, where Marxism was disrespected, where postmodernism was disrespected, where these initiatives were either not understood, dismissed, but never given the space or the acknowledgement that both he and I believed should have been done. Not to pander us, we didn't need it. Being products of the elite schools in the United States, we had already gotten a lot of privileges. We didn't need them more. But the students and the profession needed it, and it was a shame that it wasn't done. But Steve and I agonized. And one of the things we told each other was, OK, Steve is going to stay at the university for all kinds of reasons and continue to try to teach, as we had been doing, but of course no longer with me in the conjoint classes we taught. And I would undertake something else, to answer a question that we had struggled with for so many years. Could we take the new direction of Marxian economics around the surplus, around overdetermination, an idea that represents how postmodernism can change and affect work in economics and work in Marxian economics. 
Could we translate that into a popular, generally acceptable discourse that could be presented to American audiences using social media and conventional mass media? Could we translate it so that the activism that others have spoken of, that Steve always believed his work to be, could be actually realized. And so together, over the last three or four years, we worked on how to do that. Because he stayed at the university, and because I was free of the university, I chose the word carefully, because I was free, I had the time. And so I moved to New York City, because that's the place to do this sort of thing, to see whether one could go to the American people with a critique of the crisis that is easily extendable into a critique of capitalism as a system that can be articulated in relationship to Marx and that can become popularly acceptable. Is that feasible? And one of the few things that I think gave Steve and me really good feelings over the last three or four years was that we were able to demonstrate that the answer to that question is an unambiguous yes. That given us, give us half a chance, we can explain the surplus theory, the overdetermination theory, to understand what's wrong with the capitalist system and how this crisis demonstrates and illustrates that the only question left is how in the world could a population continue to accept a system that works this badly for such an overwhelming majority of the people in it. Well, for me, it has been an, ex an unspeakable joy and pleasure to have been involved in a project like this, to have worked as closely as Steve and I were able to work for all those years to do this. It's not this or that book, although we're proud of those. And I want to express my appreciation to the editors from MIT Press who came here today and are among you. Uh, it's an unusual thing for a publisher to be as interested in, in just another bunch of officers. And the MIT Press has been a wonderful press to deal with. Uh, we chose it in part because Steve got his PhD from MIT and was tickled pink at the thought that, uh, in a sense, he came in with MIT and he would go out uh, with MIT, but we were not unaware that it was a kind of enjoyable provocation for us to confront the economics profession where MIT has a nice elite status with the problem that the current textbook to be used in comparing neoclassical Keynesian and Marxian theory, textbook promoted by MIT Press is a textbook written by two Marxists something a few years ago would have been and was virtually unthinkable. So we turned down Oxford and we turned down Routledge and we turned down a whole bunch. A new experience for us, like it has been for me to be a public uh, advocate for a particular perspective over the last three years, an amazing thing. Steve and I in the past had always had to go to the publishers to beg them to publish our work. But the last time we wrote something together, Steve and I enjoyed being the object of a bidding war. Something economists like to imagine, but don't usually enjoy. Mm -hmm. And we're very pleased with the decision we made. MIT was the right choice for us, uh, and that has been proven to be the case. It was a remarkable adventure. Marxism is exciting for us, and always was. Working together, being really close friends as well as collaborators. Extraordinary experience. And for those of you that are young folks that are starting out, Try to recreate something like this with any or all of those ingredients. It's the best way to go in a profession and an academia that is under increasing pressure, as you all know, jobs shrinking, social prestige collapsing, distance learning being the euphemism for taking things away from people that they should have been able to have long ago. If Steve were standing here, he'd want to say these things with intensity because they're the purpose and the meaning of his life. And for whatever benefits he gave to his family, his friends, and his students, they come out of the passion that he had for a system that he knew the world has to do better than. 
the many times he told me of watching his exhausted mother come home from her job, standing on her feet all day, in Filene's basement department store as a clerk as he was growing up, taught him what all of his later refinement in academic work only sharpened. Human beings can do better than a capitalist system, and the best thing he can do is help people see it and move forward on that basis. That's the only way I know how to do honor to a man who gave himself to that, and I ask you all to think about it as a way to do honor to his memory and to the possibility that you can see in these students that they're going to carry this work forward in the future as much as they have done in the past. Thank you very much.